Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Passive Income MBA, Investing in Real Estate Syndications. Today, I'm so happy to have my friend Todd Salzinger on. Todd, thanks for being on. Oh, Suja, it's great to be here with you. Awesome. Well, everybody, Todd is a former Silicon Valley finance executive turned real estate investor with a focus on the growing niche of mobile home park investing. His company, Blue Elm Investments, has built the expertise to turn neglected mobile home parks into vibrant communities, increasing the availability of safe, clean, and affordable housing for their residents, while offering their investors a strategic way to diversify their portfolios. Todd is also co-author of Success Habits for, of Super Achievers, a number one Amazon bestseller with secrets, tips, and inspiration to accelerate your success. Todd, so great to have you on. Why don't you take us back in time and give the listeners a little bit of color, a brief overview of where you started in the real estate space, why you started, and how you got to where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I uh, kind of took a typical path uh, that many of us take, just going to school, getting a degree, getting, you know, getting out and uh, finding a W-2 job. And I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I, after I graduated from San Jose State, I started working for a networking hardware company with these you know, super cheap stock options with this dream of, oh, this company is going to go public and I'm going to make millions. And that does happen for some people in Silicon Valley, but so much of it is is luck and timing. And I worked, ended up working for a couple different companies, some that went public, a few of them that were absolute can't misses that ended up either, you know, being acquired or just going out of business and, you know, layoffs, restructuring, um, and just, you know, a lot of things just create a lot of uncertainty from a, from a professional standpoint. Um, so I, you know, worked for, uh, you know, qu quite a few good uh, Silicon Valley companies uh, over a 20 plus year period. And uh, during that time, though, I started to research real estate. I, uh, you know, met a few people that were uh, investing in real estate. And that was just totally outside anything that I had ever thought of before. I uh, started listening to a lot of podcasts and educating myself about real estate and um, also went down a path that I think a lot of early real estate investors do is I started buying single family homes. And I went to the Dallas Fort Worth market first and started buying some single family homes there with this idea of, oh, if I had enough uh, single family homes, the income from those could replace my W-2 income. And, uh, you know, after a time, I realized that was going to be pretty difficult to do. And, uh, you know, for every home you buy, I'd have to come up with $25,000, $30,000 down. And it would take a long time to build up a big enough portfolio to really replace that income. And it was also around that time after I bought those houses that I learned about real estate syndication. And I went to the Real Estate Guys Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar, uh, actually the first time back in 2015, you know, with this idea that I could combine my uh, corporate finance experience with my passion for real estate and <clears throat> help investors invest passively. And uh, after that, I didn't do anything about it. Uh, you know, life got in the way, work was really busy and uh, didn't take action, actually jump in and, and start to work on syndications. I went back to that event back in 2018 and decided, okay, if I'm going to dive into this, like it's going to be now or never. So uh, at that point in time, I cut back at my uh, W-2 job to four days a week. So I was able to focus a day a week, just looking at, uh, just looking at syndications, looking at deals, talking to brokers, talking to investors um, and uh, started the, my company Blue Elm Investments to put together syndications. Awesome. Yeah, that's quite the um, quite the journey, you know, um, what you went through in Silicon Valley and then deciding to switch to real estate. Uh, what would you say that sort of major attracting factors were um, like from the viewpoint of working in Silicon Valley to real estate? Um, well, th there's a lot of, you know, great things about, you know, being, you know, being able to work in Silicon Valley, work with some, you know, good companies, you know, worked with a lot of great people, got to travel all over the world. So it's definitely those, those, those benefits for sure. Um, you know, and having a steady paycheck, things like that, that come back, you know, the comforts of having a, a W-2 job. The downsides to it uh, were that in, uh, uh, you know, in, in a finance role and kind of those administrative roles, uh, you know, I was uh, at different companies that were either 
uh, bought by bigger companies that didn't need to finance HR IT departments. Um, I was asked to relocate at one point in time. I was working for a great company and they shifted where all the, their finance staff was going to be located. And I, at that point in time, wasn't, didn't want to relocate. Um, I've been other companies. I mentioned some of the, uh, one of the ones before that was a can't miss IPO that just ended up, you know, downsizing and, and going out of business. So, um, you know, over time, I just felt you know, less and less comfortable with um, you know, not having control of my own destiny, being in those roles. Um, and I had looked into other ways maybe to, uh, you know, get outside of uh, corporate finance. I looked into, you know, different kinds of franchises and other businesses. And um, just over time, I, I just, uh, you know, had a, uh, I was just kind of pulled in the direction of real estate just because it's historical ability to, to build people's wealth over time, the ability to borrow money, um, uh, just like so many things about all the benefits of real estate that drew me to that. Um, and then kind of that combination with learning about syndication made me think, well, I can really build a business around this to, you know, help people that I know that, that would like to get into real estate investing, but don't want to do the heavy lifting of looking for deals and, and raising money and managing properties and all those things. Awesome. Okay, so Todd, I know you're a mobile home park expert. Why don't you share with the listeners some of the things you love about this asset class? Yeah, yeah, mobile home parks are really interesting. They're they're still kind of a niche investment, and they're 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 growing a lot because more and more people are, are getting into that space now. Um, as some of the other asset classes like single family homes and apartments, uh, the cap rates are starting to compress and prices are prices are increasing. And I had been following mobile home parks uh, on a with a few different uh, operators that I I knew and listening to a lot of podcasts. And um, I just, the things that drew me to it were some of the things that like recession resistancy, um, they're historically res resistant to recessions in that there's, there's typically always need for affordable housing, even if there's, um, you know, in a typical recessionary environment where people might move from a class apartments down to B class and then down to C class. If they, uh, you know, have a decreased income over time, there's <clears throat> typically really, uh, you know, a strength in the affordable housing space. Um, and also mobile home parks were interesting because it's the only asset class that there's a, a fewer number of mobile home parks in, across the country every year. There's rarely new mobile home parks being built just due to zoning and kind of a not in my backyard um, feeling in a lot of communities, but they're oftentimes redeveloped for better use. So where there's always more homes and apartments being built, the number of mobile home uh, mobile home parks uh, in the country are always decreasing. So that was attractive. Um, there's often opportunities for uh, value add because a lot of the parks are owned by people that have owned them for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years that don't have the, you know, maybe professionalism or expertise to really run the mobile home park as uh, efficiently as they can, um, or may not have had the resource over time to invest in uh, fixing up vacant homes, infilling vacant lots, or doing other improvements to the park. So there can be a lot of opportunities in the mobile home park business to go in and, uh, you know, go in and find a park, uh, invest resources in the most effective way and uh, make it a better place for people to live and give a good return to investors. Yeah. Um, why don't you dive, I wanna touch on something a little more, which is how these places can become nicer places to live for the, fam the people that are there. How have you seen that play out when, in your experience with mobile home parks? Um, well, uh, like I had mentioned, uh, a lot of times the owners just don't have the resources or the desire to really make their park nicer. I mean, it's not uncommon to find a park that is that is in okay shape, but might only be 50% occupied. And I know when I, uh, on my mobile home park consulting business side, when I talk to potential clients about looking at, at parks that are for sale, they'll say, well, like, how could a park, you know, kind of uh, get to the state and be neglected and only get down to 50% occupancy? But then when you look at the ownership, it's a, you know, a lot of times there might be aging owners that have owned the park for a long time. So if you've got somebody who's 60, 65, 70, or even older, who's had the park for a long time, park might be paid for. So that, you know, there's no debt on the property. You know, they might not have the energy or the wherewithal to uh, either from their current resources or to take out uh, additional debt on the property to, 
again, like rehab the existing homes, maybe fix the roads, clean up the park, um, bring in new homes to fill vacant lots. So they might be sitting there thinking, okay, this 50% occupied property gets me the income I need. I'm fine here but they don't have the resource to really uh, clean the park up. So we've, we've gone into parks and, um, you know, done things like, you know, fix the roads, um, just done a lot of general cleanup from a landscaping and maintenance uh, standpoint. Um, uh, some of the parks that we have, the, we own the homes themselves versus the tenants owning the homes. Um, and they lean more towards the, the ones that the park owns. So sometimes with those, you've just got to go in, paint them, clean them up. Um, a lot of times the skirting may have been uh, damaged so you can uh, you know, replace the skirting on the homes. So there's kind of some like general like beautification that you can do <clears throat> that oftentimes with uh, someone who's owned the park for a long time, again, they just don't have the resources or the energy to go and do those kind of uh, turnarounds. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's such an important consideration when doing mobile home park investing is knowing that you can actually take a place that's maybe doesn't have as a homey of a feel and um, improve the operations and turn it into a place that's like a much more enjoyable place for people to live, work, and play. And so, great. Yeah, and you do see that from a uh, from a rent standpoint as well. Like we go into some parks where the the rents might be pretty far below market. And a lot of it's because the rest of the park isn't attractive. So sometimes a, a value add play is to actually go in and do some of that cleanup, make the park look nicer in general, because if there's a, you know, a vacant home that's in disrepair or is dirty and hasn't been painted or cleaned up in a long time, somebody's not going to want to move into the house next to it. So some of it, so you can kind of clean up a lot of the houses, even if they're vacant, as you're in the process of remodeling those, it just makes the park more attractive and com can command higher rents for those new residents that want to come live there. Yeah, for sure. So tell us about, Todd, your first um, mobile home park deal. How did you put it together? How did you find it? Tell us that story. Sure. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, looking for looking for deals for quite a long time, probably at least nine months, uh, looking on some of the typical things like Crexy and LoopNet, but I was also making direct contacts with other mobile home brokers and mobile home park brokers or other commercial brokers that had listings for parks. So just did made a lot of phone calls, looked at a lot of different markets, trying to find parks. And um, there was a, a somebody that I was working with at the time and we were going to come together and we, we were just gonna go ahead and try to find a park together and, and buy, it, uh, buy it ourselves. Um, so I, during that process, I found uh, these two parks in Georgia. They're about 71 spaces, about a mile from each other. Um, you know, a smaller market, but a strong market from a rental standpoint and kind of good economic diversity. And um, during that process, uh, the, my, the partner I was working with found out that his equity partners weren't going to be able to bring in as much money to the deal as they thought. So I kind of immediately had to pivot and go out to the rest of my investor list that I've been talking to and try to pull together the deal myself. So I kind of went from initially thinking I was going to do just a partnership with somebody to going out and raising from a bigger group of limited partner investors to close on the parks. Awesome. Yeah, I bet that was uh, an exciting ride. How did it go? Um, well, it's again, it's kind of funny. It, it, in this, uh, when you're raising money to put deals together, I think it often happens that you kind of think, "Oh my gosh, I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to raise enough." To, I, I went to this one point of, I like over raising by about twenty percent. So I kind of went from, "Oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get there," to, "Oh my gosh, I've got too many investors. I have to uh, tell a few people they weren't going to be able to invest in the deal." So, um, so overall, it was successful because we were able to close on the park. Awesome. And how is it going uh, running that park? Um, it's, been, it's been good. It's been a great experience. Um, we closed on the park at the end of 2019. So, um, so the, the timing wasn't ideal because we kind of ran right into COVID. And the, when I was looking for mobile home parks to buy, I was looking for parks that were in landlord-friendly states. Um, uh, just, uh, you know, just I think that's, you know, the safer places to invest in terms of being able to uh, evict tenants who aren't paying. Um, and the, the parks, uh, the initial parks I bought were in Georgia. When COVID hit the, and the eviction moratorium was put into place, that kind of tied our hands in terms of being able to evict people. So um, there were a few people 
in our parks that were affected by COVID from a job loss standpoint. Um, there were a handful of others that just took advantage of the situation, knowing they couldn't be evicted and decided not to pay. <clears throat> so that's probably been our biggest struggle uh, with the operations at that park is just not being able to evict people who are taking advantage of the eviction moratoriums. Mm -hmm. And have you, um, what strategies have you had to employ to deal with that? Um, well, uh, the, the one the kind of biggest thing we've done to try to mitigate those uh, the costs related to that was there's the, finally there was a few uh, government agencies that uh, came out and said they would work with landlords and tenants to help people. So there was one in Georgia in particular that um, we started down the, the path of uh, working with them to work with our tenants to be able to collect some of that back rent. So that's been, you know, one kind of the main thing we've done to try to mitigate some of that cost. Um, you know, other than that, you're, you're really, you're really stuck. I mean, if you have a, a tenant that for whether they're being honest about it or not, if they said that their job has been affected by COVID, COVID, they can't be evicted. So we we're just trying to um, stay on top of, stay on top of local and federal eviction rules just to, you know, make sure we can, you know, follow everything we need to follow and try to get people out if they're enough, they're not paying. Yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully that will um, change over the next, you know, several months and, um, and um, yeah, good luck to you on that park. So you're a mobile home park consultant as well. What kinds of things do you look for when you're, and do you tell your clients to look for when you're looking to buy a mobile home park? Um, well, it, it, it really kind of starts with what the what the client's looking for, because the in the mobile home park business, or maybe different than in apartments, um, there could be such a variety from a uh, size and um, uh, stability and return standpoint. We've got um, you know parks that I've helped people buy that are as low as three hundred thousand dollars up to three or four million dollars, um, and within those parks, some of those might be have you know low occupancy versus you know a, a nearly full park so it's really working with uh working with each client to try to figure out um you know how much money do they want to invest kind of up front and then over time to stabilize and turn around the park and then find out what what um if they're comfortable with uh parks that have park owned homes or tenant owned homes or some mix of the two and then looking at each individual market and just trying to really work to match uh, a, you know, a park that kind of meets their, meets their investment goals. Okay. And are you usually working with individual investors in this capacity or groups of investors? Um, it, it really runs the gamut. Yeah. I've worked with, you know, individuals, um, small partnerships, other larger mobile home park operators who are looking to expand their portfolios. So um, in, in the consulting role, a lot of people, a lot of a big variety of people call into the office that, um, yeah, runs the, runs the gamut from, you know, family offices, hedge funds, mobile home park operators, or just individuals looking to get into the business. Awesome. All right. So before we hop off, I want to ask you what advice would you have to someone who's interested in getting into the mobile home park niche? Um, well, I guess that would, uh, my advice would be to decide if you want to get in passively uh, or act or I guess actively through direct ownership. Um, you know, passively is the, the, the easiest, you know, in the um, syndications I put together, you know, the limited partner investors, uh, you know, don't have to worry about any kind of anything from an operation standpoint. If somebody wanted to get more active in the business and had more funds, they wanted to allocate to those. Um, the consulting company I've worked for also takes care of uh, turnarounds and property management. So it's it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably as active as someone might be if they owned a single family home, but they had a property manager running it. You still have to make decisions about, uh, you know, how to spend money and, and allocate resources and make decisions about the park. Um, so it, it really depends kind of from a diversification standpoint, if they wanted to, you know, dive in and get some guidance and, and buy a park directly, or if they were really just interested more from a passive standpoint. Okay. Awesome. Well, Todd, it was really great. We learned a ton about mobile home parks and your journey from being a Silicon Valley finance executive into real estate. Very interesting stuff. Tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you and anything else you'd like to share. Sure. Um, yeah, my company is called Blue Elm Investments. So my email is Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, at Blue Elm Investments. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, talk anytime. I love talking real estate and uh, mobile home park business. So feel free to reach out. Awesome. All right, Todd, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tuja.